Yep. We are, we are currently happen. recording. All right. I'm gonna All shut right, down some people. I'm gonna shut down some people's videos here. Okay. You can go back and silence me if you need. Remove some video action here. Yeah. So we get our stage clear to Mark. There. We have 28 people in the room, including you and I right now, Mark. Yep, so that means we're a few away, right? Because I don't believe DG or Stacy were probably signed up either. There's one more. Should we give it just a minute or two, you think? I'll leave that up to you. Okay, we'll give them a minute. Sure. Sounds good. There, um, DG just put, uh, there were 36 signed up without him. So he said, give him a minute and then blast off. Yep, we got a couple people yep. rolling in still. Yep. There we go. Dave's audio is still open. All right. you, you want to listen to him work out? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like somebody's having a heart attack. Just mute. <laughs> well, is there anyone else there or should we be listening for you? <laughs> John, I'm, I'm going to mute. All right. Excellent. Uh, thanks all for coming. We're just going to give another minute or two to see if any more participants show up. We're expecting just a couple more people and we'll get started. Yep, we just got one more. All right, I'm gonna get started. All right. Cool, all right. Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, Kohlberg's theory of moral development. Um, my name is Mark Fernandes. I'm uh, actually an outgoing member of the Children's Committee over here in PSA Rocky Mountain. Um, big thank you to Josh Fogg, who's joining. Um, he's going to be my tech driver and uh, taking care of all that stuff. And I really want to thank Dave Gregory, our ed director, and uh, Stacey Garish and the whole Children's Committee for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak to you guys today. And again, I just want to thank you guys so much for joining us. I know it's really strange and a lot of us uh, to not be on snow at this time. So it's, it's a lot of fun to be able to talk about something that's, uh, that pertains to the stuff that we love doing. Um, so thanks for that. Um, I'm going to start out just really quickly with just sort of some rules of engagement. Um, I know this is kind of a weird way uh, to be doing some of this stuff. So just to make it a little bit easier for Josh to drive um, all the tech stuff and for me to present, um, we're going to kind of set up how this is all going to work. So, I'm gonna be presenting in five to 10 minute chunks um, with some videos and some different stuff. And then we'll open up for a quick question or two after each segment if something's pressing. Um, but otherwise there is gonna be a question and answer period at the end. We've, we've set aside at least 20 minutes for us to kind of chat uh, towards the end of this thing. Um, and then uh, Josh is gonna walk us through really quickly. He's gonna share his screen with us. Uh, everybody has different methods of connecting, but he's gonna show you. So there's a function called the chat function. Um, and he's gonna go ahead and show us that. And there's also a way that you can raise your hand. And Josh is gonna be keeping an eye on that stuff for me. Um, and he'll give me a shout out if I need to direct my attention that way. 
Can we go ahead and do that now, Mark? Yeah, let's just go and let's show them what that looks like. Okay. All right, a quick share of my screen here. You can see down here near the bottom, I might have a couple things that you don't have, but you can see that I've got this chat function and you can probably see on the uh, right hand side of the screen here, I've got the Zoom group chat open. I've also clicked on the manage participants or the participants link here and that's opened up the top part of my screen on the right here as well to show all the participants. In there, there's a couple buttons near the bottom, one of which you'll find that says raise hand. And what that does, if you click on that, then it'll flash on my screen back here in Carbondale, just like Jen did. And I can see that Jen raised her hand, so she might have a question right now. So we could actually unmute Jen. Hello, Jen. Do you have Hello. a question for us? I was just um, accidentally hit that, but I'm glad to see that it works. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect example. Thank you very much. I'm going to lower your hand and mute you. Thank you. Great. So that's how, that's one of the ways that you can, uh, you can chime in if things aren't working out for you. If you have a question for Mark, you can uh, you, you essentially let me know and I'll be able to get it to Mark as quick as I can or where it fits in. The other way that you can participate is through the chat. The chat is uh, open right now to everyone. So you'd be, you can chat amongst everyone. If you have a question and you'd rather type it, you feel free to type a question in there. A couple things you should know about our videos is that the chat is saved. And uh, if you do know how to do a private chat, that's, that's great. Uh, when you save a chat, it saves everything. So if you have a bunch of, if you're, if you're picking on us on the side, we're going to be able to see it afterwards. <laughs> um, but honestly, that doesn't uh, mean you it's, can't. A, it's a great way to participate as well, or to just toss in a thought that you think might be helpful without necessarily interrupting the flow. Um, one of the things I'm going to do here is I'm going to pop in uh, the link to our playlist for our videos in the chat room right now. And what that's gonna do is, that's gonna give you, if for some reason when we're sharing the screen, if our videos are slow or they're not broadcasting well, you can go and you can open up another window and watch the videos on the side here um, so that uh, everything runs as smooth as we can make it work. So there's the link. The last thing you should know about uh, how things are working is, as I mentioned, this is recorded. Uh, we're recording these webinars so that we may share them with uh, people who weren't able to attend right now. So I think that's all I get to share with you there, Mark. So I'm going to stop yep. the screen and pass it off back to you. Cool. So um, Josh, while um, I'm getting ready, I'm going to do a little bit of a primer. You can go ahead and get that first YouTube uh, queued up. Okay. And so guys, one of the things I kind of want us to turn our brain on to is I'm going to be showing us a bunch of interview videos um, from the internet of kids of different ages. And one of the things I kind of want you to open your brain up to is just kind of watching these with the lens of trying to make an understanding of a judgment of how these kids are, are making their decisions about what's right and wrong and, and what's morally correct or not correct in each situation. That's kind of why I presented these videos is kind of, I, I realized when I was looking at this that it's very difficult to look at this stuff in a vacuum. You essentially need test subjects, right? Nobody writes a book on psychology without case studies. So essentially we're using these as kind of our case studies as we go through. So this first video, you're gonna see kids of all different ages um, being interviewed on the street and um, I'm going to let it just play, but I want you to see how different ages cue to different answers and how they kind of shift their definitions of what naughty is and, and who's making those decisions. So looks like Josh is ready to set us up. Let's, let's kick it off with some funniness. Subject of uh, children doing adult things. I showed this video last night. It's a young boy. It was asked by his uncle to list all the curse words he knows, and it uh, turns out he knows some pretty good ones. Tell me all the bad words you know. Go. Crap. Shut up, butthead, butthole, and butt crack, butt night, butt, butt nose, butt face, butt head, butt crack, butt ear, butt mouth, butt teeth, butt head, and. <laughs> And 
summary. I don't remember I said that word when I was his age. I don't, maybe I'm not sure. I don't know what age kids start talking like that because they hide it from you when you're, you're their parents. So in the interest of science, we sent a camera out onto Hollywood Boulevard today. We asked a bunch of kids to list all the bad words they know. Now, do you know any naughty words? Naughty words? Yes. Naughty words? Tell me some naughty words. No. No? Um, stupid. Um, hush. And... Shut up. Dumb. Punk. Stupid poop. Um, you're ugly. Um, I know ass. I know, um, bitch. I hate you. Okay. You look stupid. Crap! Donkey. Um, pony boy. Um, screwed. And sucked. I don't know any naughty words. You don't know any naughty words? Okay. I'm kind of dumb and and um let me and and I know stupid S I T H. I mean, S-H-I- Oh, gotcha, gotcha. That makes more sense. Well... <laughs> awesome. I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, especially the fact that Sith is an analogous to shit. I really enjoyed that that, you know, that happened in that, uh, whether it was on purpose or not. It's awesome. Um, so Josh, if you want, you can start uh, prepping uh, the PowerPoint here. But one of the things I asked you guys to clue into, and it's really interesting, like the kid in the Hurley shirt opens up with like, I don't really know any naughty words. And what that kind of made me think of is like, well, maybe he comes from a family or things where that stuff isn't necessarily forbidden, or it's a little bit different. And then he realizes like, oh, other people don't think that that's okay to say or different pieces like that. And you can see, especially in the different ages, you know, the little girl starts out uh, just talking about naughty words. Uh, you can go ahead and advance to the next one, Josh. Um, the naughty words, you know, she's definitely in that like three or four year old range. And it seems like she was prompted, like, you know, her daddy was like, oh, you know, that thing that mommy always says to dad when he's talking about sports or whatever that could be. And then she's like, oh, it's totally okay to do that. So I'm going to run through, I know a lot of us have seen this stuff before, but I just want to run through this um, just so we have a baseline of what we're talking about. And then we're going to watch another video and that'll be the first time that I'm kind of opening up for questions. And I know I've had a few people join in, so I'm just going to revisit really quickly. My name is Mark Fernandes um, and I've got Josh Fogg running my tech uh, behind the scenes. So when you hear me talking to him, you're like, who's he talking to? Who's, he is the wizard behind the curtain right now. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so Kohlberg's theory of moral development actually has more pieces to it than we use in PSAA. Uh, both, I think, for simplicity's sake and for the fact that we really want to focus on the kids' ages that we're worried about teaching, um, we separate them into these four categories. So that three to five-year-old preschool, we really talk about good is good, bad is bad. And you know that idea is there's not a lot of nuance there. It's black and white. Um, it's very specific. Um, it's very environment-based, right? They, you know, they start to learn that there are things they can do at home that they can't do at school, but they really need a set parameter and a set rules that really put them sort of in the box of what is okay. You know, they don't, they don't want to be bad. They want to be good. So it's very important that they know the distinction. And then as kids move up into that age, like six, going up through, you know, that adolescent, we turn this clever as a fox. And I think it's really important, um, especially when working with this age, to understand that they are testing boundaries. They are really starting to think about uh, their own um, thought process of what's important. And I think the clever piece comes in is that they want to test adults, right? They want to test their boundaries. They want to see and identify what's okay and what isn't in any given situation. 
uh, when Josh and I were chatting about this. And Josh is, of course, invited to chime in whenever he needs to. So he will, he will pop in as needed. But when Josh and I were talking about this, he talked about how important it is with this age that you set, you set um, situations. I love how he put this. You set situations where they can test their boundaries of what's good and bad without pushing all the way out into the behaviors you don't want. So, you know, you kind of have to make room for that experimentation um, without it leading into those places where you're a little nervous about where they end up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, one, of the, one of the things that keyed in for me, Mark, was uh, a friend of mine once describing uh, kids at this age as having an insatiable thirst to find the boundaries. Yes. <laughs> that, that's pretty much what they're, what they're up to. And that if I can give them opportunities, not, not just to shut them down all the time, but to help them find those boundaries, then, then we can help move them along. In their development as well. Yep. And it's one of the cool things that I've kind of come up with while thinking about this is that it, it allows us, you know, this framework gives us a sense of where they might be, but it also, I love what Josh is talking about. It gives us a sense of how to help them develop and how, and how to make decisions for themselves in a way that, that don't hinder the group and, and can be a really good safe learning environment for them. Then moving on into what we call the tweens or the later adolescents, um, we call this group the all in favor say I. So this is a group that is very, um, very keen to what their peers are up to, uh, socially agreed upon norms. Um, they can be very, very sensitive. So it, it, you know, they may have sort of a tough exterior and they're like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm 10 now. I know all these things and I'm, I'm the big guy at school. But, you know, they, they want to fit in. They don't want to be singled out. You know, it's very challenging for them to kind of fall into that piece. And then moving on, and these can all overlap as well. Uh, that last group, and I put 11 to 99 years because, you know, hopefully we get there, but not everyone does, and we get there in different ways. But listen to your conscience is really about developing essentially your own moral code, your own understanding that rules can change, that they are agreed upon. You know, one of the things that I think about when I think about listen to your conscience is no matter how you feel about politics, you understand that it's important that there's like, an agreed upon set of rules or things that people do together. Um, and you may have very defined ideas about what that is, but you also understand that, that um, it doesn't uh, just govern yourself. It has to govern more people. Um, and then that can be really difficult even for someone who's quite mature and sees that, it, it's hard for them to kind of make that distinction. Um, and they do start to, and especially in that listen to your conscience, you, you start to see uh, the benefit not move just within yourself and being self-isolated, but a benefit for more people and understanding the group. We can advance to the next slide, Josh, and I'm going to move through these pretty quick. And so one of the things that I started to realize as I looked at this uh, thing again is kind of looking at, yep, you can throw self-identity up there. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about emotional intelligence or EQ and these, a lot of these senses of how we interact with the world is what creates this understanding of our moral development. And so go ahead to the next one. So that self-identity comes from other people and bringing it in and shaped by the interaction with others, right? This isn't sort of things we learn or create with ourselves in a vacuum. We learn these from other people, whether it's our parents or other things, you can go to the next one. And understanding that the age ranges are very approximate. Like we, you know, it's, we put the age ranges up sort of, I guess the best way to describe it is a suggestion um, because it's very much uh, people develop at their own time and rates. And depending on the situation, you can actually vacillate between different ones. One of the videos I'm going to show you later, actually, I think really highlights how somebody can be firmly in one of these and the other in the same person. Next one, please. We are also talking a lot about how parenting style and school environment and their own life experience really kind of leads to this. And then I actually already mentioned this going to the last piece is how in some ways, this is sort of the beginnings of how a child begins to relate and understand what's right and wrong. And I think it's the beginnings of how we call now EI or EQ and that relationship within a group of what's right and wrong. How do we self-manage? How do we I, have that self-awareness of how we work in a group? And uh, that's it, I believe. Do I have anything else? Nope, cool. So we're gonna get ready for our next video. I, I keep reaching for my screen, Josh. I so badly wanna drive, but thank you so much. <laughs> awesome. So uh, this next video, many of you may have seen, um, it went viral a few years ago. It's hysterical. Um, this is 
right in there and the good is good, bad is bad. And for, we're gonna have a debrief on this one. So we'll have about five minutes after we watch this one, if anybody wants to raise their hand or chime in. Um, but I just want you to look in this, I'm gonna give you a little primer before we played it. And I just want you to notice how confused this little boy is. Like, it's very easy to get caught up in the funny things that happen, but just watch how confused he is. Like, I'm listen to me, listen to me. Like, like I do this all the time, and if I go out at the, at the house with the little girl, Matthew has his toys, and then Matthew has all his toys. Okay. But I have to yell at you guys. Okay, Linda, Linda, listen, 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 you... listen, listen, Linda, listen. Okay, what? Like everything they do at this house, they can touch everything at Grandma's house. Okay. Okay, then what? Then you're not listening to me. Then you're not listening to me. I asked you not to do something. Linda, but listen to me. Look at if we do something, if you get that out, that bird thing off, you're gonna break it. Okay, but I'm asking, I'm letting you know but that you cannot. No, Linda, I'm. Linda, li look at, look at. You're not listening to me. Linda, listen to me now. Look at, look listen to me listen now. To, listen to me. No, you're not listening. I said no cupcakes, and you try to get cupcakes, and you try to ask Grandma. Linda, Didn't you? Linda, lick it, lick it, lick it. If we do something right out, just if we, if we get a chloe left, you can't even get them. You're going to burn your butt. What's going to burn your butt? Linda. You and Kevin don't listen. So I have to give both of you guys pop pals in your butt. But Linda, but Grandpa's but going to give you pop pals in your butt. No, he's not. Yeah. I have to. You want? You don't want me to hit Kevin or you don't want me to spank you? No. Why? Because anybody oh, wants to spank me. Then I have to spank Kevin. The, but he's my little pop-ups. He's your little pop-ups, but he doesn't listen. But Linda, honey, honey, look at, look at this. Right oh, now, we can't do anything oh, if we can't get everything out of the floor. Oh, if we're going to break everything down. I'm not breaking anything down. I'm just letting you know Linda, you cannot it, have it, cupcakes it, for dinner. It, Linda. Linda, like this thing, I never belong to you. Anything, you can get anything and anything and anything. I'm done arguing with you. I'm done arguing with you. You need to listen to the things that I say because I'm the mom and I'm the dog. Linda, look at, listen to me. All the time to get them, the, the, this thing, this, this, this <laughs> thing, but the, oh. yeah. Because I'm because done break. arguing with you. Linda, I'm done arguing with you. <laughs> As you probably know, when <laughs> most amazing. <laughs> Linda, listen, listen, honey. I think what, the the part I love about this video the most is no matter how funny it is, we've all been in this sort of frustrating piece with a kid before, right? Whether it was, you know, many people have their own children, nieces, nephews, or teaching. And one of the things that I see in this is the mom never addresses that they're essentially dealing with two sets of rules, right? You know, um, the little boy references um, is, you know, I can't touch anything here, but at grandma's house or grandpa's house or here and there. And so he's essentially trying to make the argument of, but it's okay, but now it's not. And I'm going to get papa. Nobody wants papa on their bum, right? Um, and so does anybody have any questions or anything like to chime in? Feel free. Jump on the chat, raise your hand. Uh, Josh have, is ready. If he's we got do something. have one. We've uh, cool. your good friend Chino Martinez is called in. What the hell is Chino doing? <laughs> Chino, <laughs> you, Mike is hey. How are hey, you? Hey Chino. Mark. Chino. The reason the reason that I, I raised my hand was because the kids sound like me. Perfect. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I know sometimes you struggle with different rules, and we all end up on different parts of this morality scale. You know. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was just, um, I was just having fun. No, 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 it's fine. So, Chino, here's a question for you. you. You've raised some kids. How often does the disagreement or the idea, you know, when you end up in a situation like this where, you know, they're essentially trapped, right? They're, they're trying to work out a situation, but they're essentially both arguing two different points, right? They're not in the same world here, right? And, and what are some ways that you've been able to handle that with your own children? It's just, the, um, it's just fun because you have to, unless he goes 
a hundred percent the way they looking at it or listen at it, you don't you don't get it. <laughs> right. They yeah. they keep repeating the same thing over and over and over and over and over. <laughs> right. Well, and especially him, like he's <laughs> BJ Agu. I just said, isn't that how Cousin Vinny became a lawyer? Sure. And <laughs> and lawyers are really good at this, right? Like there is a sense of, you know, and you could hear him, he actually repeats a lot of his mother's language back to him, which is probably his attempt of trying to like understand her point of view or at least restate it, right? But Chino brings up a great point of like, if you're not willing to actually adopt or at least adapt to their point of view enough to get that into your understanding, it's gonna be really hard to come to an agreement or make sense of that. It's funny because he, he, the kid is looking at, at, at her like, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but you know, listen to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And she's saying the same thing, right? Like, exactly. they're both like, you're not listening. And, and honestly, I get it. The kid's like, dude, there's cupcakes right there. Mom, <laughs> please get me a cupcake. <laughs> you know? <laughs> exactly. And if exactly. anybody doesn't know how the story ends, he ends up on the Ellen show with a room full of cupcakes. So the kid ends up okay. No way. Fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Chino, thanks so much. Thanks, man. Good to hear your voice. All right, we got anything else out there, Foggy? Nope, not right now. Well, let's, let's roll to the, the uh, my cousin Vinny uh, <laughs> question. <laughs> well, I mean, I think I addressed it to a point, but it's true. Like lawyers, in some ways, are better at this than anybody, right? They they spend a lot of time slicing distinctions. You know, whether we call it semantic arguments or whatever it is, you know, that essentially interpreting law. A lot of times, that's what it comes down to, right? Can you be just a little bit more right than another right point of view? So we could prep that next video. And um, this is uh, actually a Johnny Carson interview um, from 1982 uh, when Drew Barrymore had actually just started in ET. Um, and Josh, this one we're gonna start at the start. Yep. And one of the things I want you to focus on, this one I'm using for our Clever as a Fox part. And I want you to see how many questions or times that she's testing Johnny. All right, we've got a few more questions to come to, but that's, but that's where we're gonna start with this one. Amazing pictures come out in the past few years is E.T., and this young lady has earned a great deal of attention from her appearance in it, and um, she is just seven years old. Would you welcome, please, Drew Barrymore. That's a pretty funny entrance. Did you rehearse that? <laughs> Did you rehearse that? <laughs> no. Are you okay? Hi. Yeah. You know, you're not the first one ever to do that on the show. We've had some other people have come in there some night, grown-up people, who've, who've missed that step and fallen <laughs> right here. It's probably my shoes because they're real slippery. Are they? Are they brand new shoes? Yeah. They're very pretty. Thank you. Yeah. Do you, you pick out your own clothes? Sometimes. Sometimes? <laughs> it's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. I've been waiting all my life to meet you, and I found you. Of your whole life. <laughs> yeah, we're going to skip ahead here. You're going to miss a part. She actually pulls out some false teeth, um, which is very funny, but it's, it doesn't have much to do with what's going on. And that we're going to start right here. Yeah? Do you like, do you like going to the dentist? Of course. <laughs> Are you serious? You're the first person I've ever met who likes to go to the dentist. Yeah, I like to have my teeth cleaned and have that yucky stuff in your mouth. It tastes good. It tastes good, huh? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know why I like going to the dentist? Why? Guess. <laughs> okay. You got a crush on Dr. Smith. That's one reason. <laughs> How old a man is your dentist? He never told me that. So, what would you guess? Is he, what would you consider an old man? Well, he's not that old. He's not that old. He's, I guess he's about in his 30s or 30. 20s. In his, or 30s or 20s. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, but that's not the reason you'd like to go, huh? Uh, no, because I don't want to have cavity, cavities. That's right. And plus, guess why? 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 Because I like going to the dances because he's teaching me things 
and I get my teeth cleaned. And you know what? He's what? very gentle with teeth. He's gentle? Yeah. That's nice. Maybe I should go to him, too. Yeah. Maybe you should. Yeah. Now, let's talk about... Want to talk about E.T. a little bit? Why not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can kill it there. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, again, open up. If you guys have any questions, thoughts after seeing that video or anything I'm about to say, please chime on in. Uh, Josh will let me know. And uh, um, we, we could set it up like an informal poll or something, but I just want you all to think, right? So Johnny thinks that she tripped on the step, but she didn't, did she? And uh, she was very sweet about it, but she definitely wanted uh, Johnny to know in a way that he, was, he could be wrong and that she slipped on her new shoes instead of there. And that's, you know, that's a big clue sometimes when you're working with this group room. We talk so much about them testing boundaries and you also have to be trustworthy in their eyes. You have to be able to like make that. And obviously she's been waiting her whole life to meet Johnny. So she loves him and she's really excited to be there. Um, but I love the whole thing about the dentist, right? Like, you know, kids sometimes will grab onto this thing where everyone else doesn't like something, but so, you know, it, it's their thing. So well, I actually really like it. And, and how, you know, what does she know that he doesn't, right? She does a lot of those things where like, oh, you, you want to guess? You want to guess why I do? Or, um, or the thing of, you know, what do I know that you don't or vice versa? So there's a lot of testing of like what you know and what you don't know. And I think that's why we love that term clever as a fox. And, and uh, we all do this even as grownups sometimes. You know, I mean, you, we've all had participants or people we've worked with or maybe even our own spouses, brothers, sisters who, who kind of play that game of like, all right, I'm going to test you a little bit. What do you know? What can you help me with? What can I help you with? Um, and that sort of uh, back and forth is really important. And one of the things I think that made Johnny Carson such an amazing interviewer is he was able to go along with that stuff. He, you know, he really listened to her and, um, you know, you think about it, you know, he was at the pinnacle, you know, Johnny Carson was like the most famous person in the United States at that time. And there he is sitting with this adorable little girl having a wonderful conversation. And it's because he's listening and he's really reacting and interested and, and that validates and honors kind of what she's saying. And it, and it makes it really interesting to her, um, which I think is really important. Does anybody have anything they want to kind of chime in, in or ask about that? Or Josh, anything you may have noticed that I'm not covering or we can keep moving? I've got more stuff to do too. No, Mark, I'm, I, I really appreciate your insights, honestly. It, it's, uh, it's cool. You know, I watched the videos earlier as we prepped, and it's interesting, the, the extra bit of insight. You know, Carson was so good at what he did that it, it like, I didn't even think and, and uh, notice all the, the subtleties that he was playing with there. And, and honestly, you know, Drew was, uh, you know, was an extremely talented young lady as well. And the interplay is very, very unique and very, very smooth, different than maybe what we expect in the real world or sure. what we, what we uh, actually uh, see and, and interact with. But um, uh, definitely uh, a, a, a neat, uh, I really appreciate the insights there. Yeah, no. And, and I think I chose that video specifically probably because she is a little bit advanced, but at the same time, I feel like nowadays with technology and the amount of video and things that kids are watching, they, they do come out with kind of the darndest things, right? You know, kids say the darndest things, so to speak, where you'll have five, six, seven year olds who drop stuff on you and you're like, you don't know that. Or, right. or you have to ask the question, like, are they parroting something they've heard? Or is it something that they actually have some sort of a rudimentary understanding of? Um, and that and that can be really challenging, and especially with the the two age groups we're supposed we're about to move into, it can be even more challenging in that way. Um, you know, trying to it's, it can be a little bit of a minefield of like, oh, like are we really going to have a discussion that's that mature, or like are we going to vacillate right back to a poop joke here in a second? Like you know, right. and being nimble enough, you know, and Johnny Carson is probably the greatest. Uh, sort of example of that. I think he's one of the greatest interviewers of all time because he, he was ready for whatever, um, you know, and, and it was, it, that was what was so cool to me. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's like watching uh, two people who were clever as a fox talk to each other. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really well said. Awesome. Let's, let's, let's uh, speaking of moving from clever as a fox all into uh, our next pieces here, let's, let's throw out our hilarious Australian girl. 
Um, if you've never seen this video, uh, you should go back and watch the whole thing at some point, but this one's quite good. Um, and then with this, um, what See, I would ask you guys to do is notice where, the... where she shifts. See the pint size surface. As you probably know, what Sorry about that. Most of no, it's all right. She is the pint size. Got it. All right. Go ahead, Mark. Cue it up. <laughs> yep. Nope, that's fine. So, yeah, um, we'll get started at the 58 second point. I'm going to cue this up for a little bit. This girl is um, in the first video, part of the video we're not going to watch. She's actually 11. And then she turns 12 and she gets brought back on this television show and she gets invited um, to compete in a, prof um, in a professional. Uh, we're getting a text. Yeah, we will show those ages again, actually. We can, um, I'll do that right after this video. Um, that'll actually be a great way for us to talk about this. Um, I want you to notice how she shifts. So I'm proposing in this video that this girl does a really great job of moving between all in favor say I and listen to your conscious um, for different reasons and different things. Um, so just kind of clue in while you're watching this and uh, yeah, and she's hysterical. So the yeah. cricket cannot interrupt Saber for one Cricket's more moment. pretty good, but, you That's know, right. let's talk about Saber for the moment. So that was about <laughs> two months ago, and since then, aside from being tipped as the next big thing in the surfing world and spending a lot of money on donuts, Saber Norris has <laughs> turned 12. She's racked up more than 90,000 social media fans, and she's appeared on The Ellen Show. Well, Saber, it's been quite a few months since we last saw you. Welcome to the show, I I'm suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The most important question is... Last time, we just had a diet segment. Your dad, Justin, you called him fat. <laughs> yeah. How's he gone through the Christmas period? Bad. Like, <laughs> like ever since I've told you guys that he's lost 20 kilograms, everybody's been telling him how great he looks. Oh. Like, he's actually started to believe it. So he's, like, he's got rid of the cucumbers, and now he's back, he's back on the, the ice, ice cream. cream. Oh, it's it's it was like, too late like, as a night before, is the it? The fame is he hasn't been good for him. He's got the thing now. Tell yeah. us how it's all going for you, yeah. though. When you're speaking about fame, you appeared on Ellen. That has had 25 million hits around the world. How was that experience? <laughs> Oh, that dressing room that Ellen gave me it was just so sick. Yeah. Like, you'd walk in, and then there'd be a long table and a humongous basket of chips, like American chips. For free. Which, was your dad with you? For free. You? For free, oh. as much as you can eat. And then there's a fridge with busy drinks, and that's all for free. <laughs> It's like, my party, it's like my own birthday party set up, yeah. except I was the only one there. Oh, so oh. good. Did you pop some in your suitcase? <laughs> I did, yeah. and my bag was only half full, so when I was going on the plane to Las Vegas, I tried to stuff as much as I could in there, but the plane was only small, so you were only allowed yeah. like a minimum amount of baggage, so oh. I had to stuff all the chips oh. in myself before they could, yeah. before they could say that it's ready to it must have been bouncing off the walls, is not there? Hey, I want to hear about Vegas, but first tell us what Ellen was like. Oh, it's just like... That's just amazing that I was sitting in the chair where Justin Bieber, Nicki Minaj sit. Now, I'm just a normal, unfamous girl from... <laughs> well, no, no, no. Not not you're famous now. now. You're famous now. But was she nice? Was she oh, kind? Her eyes are just so blue and sparkly. Like, she's really pretty in real life. Yeah. What? She's, she, I got really nervous before I went out on stage and I actually told the producer that I was going to vomit. I feel like I was going to vomit. That might have been the chips. <laughs> you know, so, but as soon as I saw Ellen, I just felt comfortable and safe, and she just helped me through. She made me look so funny. And you're, you're, you're funny. funny. Most you importantly, right, right, you're, you love your surfing. Uh, what's up next? I know you've got to get back to school and all those sorts of things, but what's up next for you? Well, I'm going back on the Ellen show. Are you? Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm going back. Wow. There. Ellen's nice enough to let me go back there. And Fantastic. next time I go there... I know that it's a big responsibility of being an Australian and I just, you my hope is to make, like, like I want to do a good job for Australia. You do a brilliant yeah. job for Australia. Take We're so proud of you. Too. Yeah, yeah, exactly to the right. Room. Stop yeah. It. Stop Spare it one. Well, you're part of our family, Sabre. So you're carrying our banner over there as well. <laughs> just quickly, out of <laughs> All right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and actually, Mindy, I was going to mention that, um, and I actually didn't realize the whole bit of it, but I did know that she competed in the X Games. I did not realize that she came in second in skateboarding. 
Um, and her family does have an interesting story. She, you know, she is sort of raised as an adventurous. Yeah, if we could flash up just the, uh, the first one, yep. So what I kind of postulated to you guys is that, you know, I really think this girl makes defined shifts. Um, Saber makes defined shifts between all in favor say aye and listen to your conscience. Um, you know, and you can, the part that really hits it home for me is how slowly and how considerately she speaks at the end when she talks about how important it is to um, do the right thing and be, and be a, you know, um, a good representative for Australia. Um, and obviously that could be part of her upbringing and she may have learned that along the way, but you can tell from the honesty of how she delivers that, that that's very much her belief. She believes that that's important. Um, and you can see her making conscious efforts to fit in, right? You know, you, you know, you see her be that adolescent little girl talking about, you know, Justin Bieber and Nicki Minaj and how many times she's probably talked about that with her friends. Um, but then, you know, she kind of dismisses, like somebody talks about bringing the suitcase in so she can take all the chips and the fizzy drinks out of the dressing room. And you can see her just kind of dismiss that. She actually ignores that anchor guy a couple of times. It's quite funny. Um, she's like, yeah, I'm not really going to get into that. So, um, I don't remember who it was. I'm sorry. I don't have the chat up, but somebody brought up um, how important it would be for us visual people to take another gander at this. It is Marcia, Mar Marcia Korn. Um, and so, yeah, so the thing that is important to this is to remember that it is very much a range, right? Um, you know, so that preschool time is the good is good, bad is bad. Clever as a fox, seven to 11, but it can leak either way, forward or backward. Um, Josh brought up the great point that even Johnny Carson in probably his mid sixties was, uh, being clever as a fox with Drew earlier. Um, all in favor say I, that idea of peer group, uh, socially agreed upon and then listen to your conscience of understanding and having a belief system that fits really within the world. Um, and I think one of the things that's important too, when you start to think about listen to your conscience is, you know, who decides what's right, you know, and all of these things, if you think about it and good is good, bad is bad. A lot of that essentially comes um, out from outs from from without, not within, right? Other people are telling you those rules are kind of laid out for you. Clever as a fox, you're starting to break that mold. You still operate under some of these good as good, bad as bad things, but you're trying to learn some of the other stuff. Then all in favor say aye, there's a big switch. That's where it starts to be that your your belief system, your thoughts, and your processes in here start to move without. You start to see that. Um, that peer group um, and the understanding within either a family unit or groups of friends and where that's important. And then in that last piece and listen to your conscience, it again goes inward, but the influence of the social um, investment and the things that we're getting from other people is where that becomes really important. Um, and so Josh is going to turn on the monitor, uh, get ready to monitor the chat and the hand raise. Um, if anybody has anything they would like to add, questions they'd like to ask, um, or some different things that they would like to bring to the table. Um, I still have a couple more thoughts in reserve that I, that I was going to kind of share at the end. But if we don't have a ton of stuff that you guys have questions about, um, I can move into that and it might spur us towards questions as well. Um, one of the big things when we're thinking about this overall is I really want us to... You know, if there was one takeaway um, that I kind of came away with for this that I really wanted people to have is, as an organization, you know, whether it's in assessments or training, we spend a lot of time focused on instructor behaviors, right, you know, pro behaviors of what we're doing. And I would really challenge us, um, and I challenge myself to do this all the time, is to understand that we have to focus on the child's behavior, you know, the act of listening and the understanding of where they are and meeting them where they are. Is where, is where the importance of this um, it really comes into play. Um, actually, Josh, can we go back to the PowerPoint? I realized I skipped one of my slides. Sure. And one of the things, you know, for me, whenever I'm working on stuff like this, like I, you know, the what comes pretty naturally, right? But the how and the why is what's always a little bit harder. So I believe it was my fourth slide. I just realized I was like, wait, I had a slide for this. Here it comes. Yep. So why? You know, it, it, we did talk about this. Yeah, yeah, no, I covered this one. Sorry. But yeah, let's talk about this again, though. So you can put them both up. So why? It helps us understand children's understanding of the rules. Like it, 
allows us to sort of have a, um, an understanding of where they might be and it gives us a framework, right? And then the how, it really guides our responses. Like I want, I want us to use it as a lens or an understanding so we can engage them in our activities in a way that's positive and that, that either reinforces uh, the better parts of themselves and the parts that make them feel good versus, you know, having to always use negative reinforcement. You know, I love what Josh shared earlier about setting it up where we allow them to test boundaries and move in directions that are positive without ever having to slam the door on them, right? No, no one, no one enjoys slamming a door and no one enjoys having a door slammed, right? There's this sense of, you know, if we have a good sense of where they are on this, uh, on these stages of moral development, then we can set up different activities in ways that will reinforce behaviors versus us always having to be the guy that's like, stop that, stop that, stop hitting, you know, that classic, like, stop touching her, <laughs> you know, if it never gets to the point where that is even uh, okay or a possibility, and then we don't have to get there. Um, and, and I've specifically not focused so much on sort of negative behavior, because I think it, the, the idea of moral development is, you know, if, if they're behaving in a way that they know is incorrect, then there's a reason they're doing that. And, that. and that's where it can be a little bit more different where it's like, are they acting out? Are they looking for attention a different way? Um, and that I don't think necessarily, I don't know if that always is a miscommunication of where they are on communication the stage. Communication where they are. Mis oh, I just heard my own voice in my head. Oh, no. um, but and those are the things that I would kind of think of. Josh, have we had anybody uh, chuck anything in the chat or raise a hand? Yeah, hold on just a second here. Um, yeah, we have one from Lynn. Can you please run me run through the exercises on how you bring this to life on snow, for example, in a CS1 or a CS2 clinic at your home mountain? Sure. Um, so one of the things and why I sort of chose using um, the subjects I did is I find it's really important for people to either observe real time or share um, experiences that highlight these pieces. Um, so I'm, you know, my background is actually in theater and film production. So I'm never afraid to invite people to role play um, or play those games of, you know, so you're four years old, here's the rules that you're used to. And now here you are at ski school, right? And, you know, one of the things I think that can be really challenging, um, especially when you're in an on-snow environment. Oh, it did, huh? Sorry, everyone. I was just letting yep. Mark know that his, uh, his video froze there, <laughs> or it froze on my end. Am I still, am I still frozen? Yes. Your audio is right. good. All right. Give me one second. Sure. There is that it? Are we good now? Yeah. Great. Um, so one of the things that I, I try to do is specifically with that younger age is not, is set up environments where it's not just the yes or no answers, right? Like how do we create environments where um, they're essentially, it's a foreign environment, right? You're going to take them out on snow and this weird equipment and you have to, um, essentially create a new sense of good is good, bad is bad, right? Like, you know, a perfect example for me always is trying to explain to someone that they're now wearing a giant, like 20 pound plastic weapon on their feet, right? They can't clomp around or kick something the same way they would if they had their sneakers on because they can actually really damage it. Like you could break that table leg, right? So it's very real time and it's very uh, reinforcing of what they're seeing and feeling and touching and not being so abstract. And then, you know, as I move up into that clever, clever as a fox environment, um, a lot of it has to do with playing the game of the boundaries. So what we'll often do is set up environments where you're teaching a group of seven or eight year olds and, you know, you start, you know, you let the participant kind of do what they're doing and then sh you can highlight or show them where they're leaving the door open to that kind of behavior that Josh was referring to of like, oh, not. All of a sudden, they're all in the woods because I didn't tell them they couldn't go over there. <laughs> and it's where they wanted to go. Um, 
and setting up environments where those things are less consequential but more obvious, right? And and the most important part I find, in, in especially in working in this stuff, is the biggest learning comes in the reflection pieces. So it's often real time stuff. It's the the classic locker room chat, you know, of I had a really rough day today. Here's what happened, and you know, those other experienced instructors or people who have a, a lot of experience with kids will highlight like, oh, you know, th this this was your opportunity to set a different guideline or parameter. Um, but yeah, Josh, do you have anything to share on that? I know you, you've you spent a lot of time training on this stuff more than I have actually. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, Lynn, uh, see your question here, you know, how do we bring that to life in an exercise rather than verbally? And um, honestly, I, when I think about this, I don't have necessarily a way to bring this model to life in an exercise. It really has more to do with how I set up the activity um, for the child. So for example, one of the things I might do if I was to really bring this to life uh, on snow is present different games and show how I would change the parameters of the game or of the activity, if you will, um, for the different uh, stages of moral development, right? For example, um, you know, if I had, if I was doing something that was, um, you know, where we were moving from one part of the mountain to the other, I could very easily set up for the younger children what the parameters of, and very define what's good and what's bad, expecting that if I for the most part, if I set up those parameters and create the definitions of what's good and bad in the activity, more or less they'll follow along in there. Once we get to that clever as a fox piece, the way I set those parameters up is I have to kind of define what the boundaries are, right? They're gonna constantly be testing it. So I might get them to engage in it by giving, by asking them to uh, participate with, with setting up the parameters, you know, um, uh, how far will ski, but I won't just ask it as an open-ended question. I'll ask it as a, uh, I think it's a semi-open question where I give them some choices to work with. So I've created an overall boundary of where we're going to go, but within that, they get to explore the boundaries within there. Um, rather than ask kids uh, of that clever as a fox age, um, what a or what trail should we try this on or what trail should we ski i'll give them a choice of two trails to work with so if i was doing this as a clinic i might do it more by example of how i would set it up rather than an activity that would address the 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 model itself i think that's that's the tricky part about this is that um the the and mark said it really well at the onset the, how we use this in PSI and Aussie is really a, 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 a smaller version of the, of the full-fledged piece there. Um, so giving them that sense of, um, of the, the idea behind the model is that we can then get a sense of how do we, how do we manage situations that are kind of complex? How do we, how do we guide our thinking a little bit? Um, an activity I think that's really that I, well said, Josh. An activity that I, she's also asking about an activity I do with instructors. Um, I assume that what you're asking is an activity I do with instructors to try to um, highlight some of the distinctions between the, the clinics. I'm getting a yes, there we go. So as if I was the <laughs> trainer and I wanted people to understand, I might actually set them up with... Um, split them up into smaller groups if I had enough people in my clinic group and give and assign them each um, one of these stages of moral development to work through so that they could and then see um, what how do we set up the activity for specifically for that moral development you know whatever it is it might be something as simple as um, if it was skiing it might be something as simple as um, doing a, a thumper turn, for example, where you're tapping your inside foot, right? The way you set that activity up and how you move the group around at large looks different. 
looks different for the younger kids than it does as they go older because their moral development keeps changing. So it's, there's a subtlety, in my opinion, of how the activity looks. So if I was to set it up for training, I would try to set up four different examples so that they could see, so that the trainees could see the distinctions. I think that's a great idea, Josh. I think one of the hard things for this, um, Lynn, is we, it's the same thing with, you know, I keep caveating about the ages and the ranges because it's very individual while we're sort of treating a group. Does that make sense? Like there's this weird dichotomy of like, you're trying to set up things that will be very successful in a group setting, but you have to have an understanding of like each individual child or participants kind of range of where they are. You know, you, you know, I brought up earlier about how much different it could be from a homeschooling perspective um, versus, you know, somebody who, uh, actually I didn't bring that up, but I, we talked about schooling and environment. You know, one of the things that I'll, I'll often postulate or bring up in training groups is, you know, hey, have you ever met kids who grew up in New York City, who grew up, you know, like taking the train to school who are like nine or 10 versus a kid who grew up uh, perhaps in suburban Chicago who gets driven to school every day in a carpool and how differently they view the world and how differently their their sense of what's right or wrong can change because of their either sheltered or unsheltered environment you know you meet a nine-year-old kid from new york those rules are very different they're going to use different language um, they're going to have a different sense of what's okay and what's not okay um, you know i always use the the sense of of cutting in line right like kids who grew up in like real urban environments like lines are not necessarily respected like you you get where you're going and you know for someone who grew up in a much more polite part of the country, they're like, wait, I've, I've been standing here. Why did they get in front of me? And, you know, one of the things that I've done is set up either in the range, like Josh was talking about setting up uh, different age ranges within the thing, actually, even within the same age range, talking about different levels of maturity or different value systems, you know, like people coming from different parts of the world. And what I will usually do to set it up um, is actually use the participants themselves. So a lot of times I'll be like, so, you know, we all have different sort of thoughts and beliefs here, right? Um, share them, you know, talk about different things and then how that influences your decision-making and how you are. Um, it, it, it's, it's such an interesting thing. I, you know, as I kind of took a big deep dive back into this thing preparing for today, it was, it, it, it struck me how often we make a lot of these decisions very intuitively and we're sort of, basing our um basing we're making a lot of assumptions and like snap judgments and I, and I actually wrote down here it's like do not always assume that the age um and stage of that kid is what you know what the number says on their card if it says they're seven or whatever it is it it, it can be very variable um, it could vary by the day you know how someone's feeling that day you know the rules can kind of shift a little bit for them and um and that's one of the big lessons that i I've always kind of to drive home on this stuff um, is, you know, the cognitive and the physical pieces there, I wouldn't say they're necessarily cleaner cut, but they're, they, they, they tend to be a little bit more apparent to us at times. It um, can be a little harder arms around for sure. Do I have anything else coming up? Did we answer Lynn's question? I believe so. I believe, well, as far awesome. as I could tell, another piece of, as, as you were talking, Mark, one of the thoughts I had as far as training too, one of the big things that this, um, how this model changed my teaching had more to do with my behaviors as an instructor. That's, that's the idea. So what it did for me for, for CS training and how uh, I can, I'm not an active uh, children's examiner anymore. Um, uh, but when I was active, one of the things that I was looking at and, and paying attention to as an examiner was how does um, a little bit of like, how does the person set the game up for the age group? For example, um, if it was within that younger age where good is good and bad is bad, part of what I'm looking for is were they reinforcing what is good and what is bad along with, you know, as the game is going on, are they reinforcing those pieces? Are they letting the children know, or are they letting the participants know? 
that what they're doing is good. That is the thing right. that, that you've asked them to do and you're reinforcing that. Or that if somebody was stepping out of line a little bit, that, you know, uh, one of the great things that I learned uh, by spending some time in New Zealand was the power of the word naughty instead of bad yeah. with that age group and how I could, uh, letting them know that they were being naughty, which then started to imply that they were doing something bad, helped direct them. When I'm looking at that Clever as a Fox group, one of the things that I was always paying attention to as an examiner was the pacing of information. Um, as, as, a, as a kid's instructor, myself, one of the things that I would do with that age group is I would be yeah, ahead to be two or three steps ahead of them all the time. Yeah. So I was constantly thinking about how do I break the activity up into these tiny little chunks that I can just be giving them really quickly. So it's like the game kept kind of shifting gears on them so fast that it made it hard for them to figure out how to break the rules. Yep. And I was like, I had to be the cleverer fox <laughs> than, yep. than they could. So it had more to do with that. When I started thinking about the all in favor say I, I realized that I had to start shifting um, my expectations uh, of what the children were going to do. If I asked them an open-ended question, they might not offer a lot of options because they're unsure of what their peers are going to think of them. So it's like I would have to shape it in a way uh, it changed how I taught a little bit into... Uh, I might share with them something that I, I would kind of turn the tables on them and I would say, well, you know, coming down this mogul field or when I'm doing a hockey stop, these are the things that I'm really focused on. And so I would try to draw them in towards me so I could be the, the I yep. <laughs> and get them to come towards me rather than force them to kind of have those funny little power struggles. So well, it's, great, it's great to hear. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I, and it just made me think about what you brought up earlier, talking about uh, for the Clever as a Fox group, you would set up like, hey, there's two trails that you can decide this on. You don't have to give them any more information. Where you move into that all in favor, say I group, you could set up the same parameters, but you might have to be like, all right, so if we do it on this trail, this is why we would choose that. And if right. we did it on this trail, this is why we choose that. Like they need a little bit more information. And they need to know that you're a little bit more invested in being a part of that group before they'll kind of meet you, right? That's the, I think that's kind of the dividing line between those two. Yep. And so for me, as, a, as an examiner and a kid's trainer, it became more about the, the nuances of how things were set up rather than that there was an activity that really drove home the, the, this model in and of itself, it was more of the subtleties of how each activity was set up, how it was reinforced and how, how the day continued that really told me as an examiner that people had ownership over this material or whether they didn't or whether they kind of um, get either run over by the kids or, or um, misunderstand uh, how the kids were responding to them. Yeah, and one of the things I've noticed, Josh, and, and some of this has come out in conversations with you, and full disclosure, Josh was my, back when it was Kids of Cred, he was my oh, examiner in 2006. Um, I feel old. <laughs> is, we're the same age. Um, <laughs> actually, technically, we're a couple months older. But um, there's the sense of, for me, um, also the understanding and the justification of why you made certain choices, right? Like, you can make these kind of choices in a vacuum sometimes and they work out. But one of the things that I see when you see that true mastery is, you know, listening to Josh and why he would make certain choices in certain ways and be like, look, first off, we know none of this is going to work in every situation, right? Like there's no magic bullet here, but like, are you making educated decisions based not on just what you think, but like what you've actually observed and what you've actually learned from these people while you're interacting with them. Um, and I think, having revisited this and you know, I keep coming back to it. I was, you know, I've been doing a lot of work on EI and EQ and I realized, I was like, wow, this is right in there. Like there's such in this where it comes from self-awareness and self-management and how you, how you view yourself within the world and how important that is. And I was like, this, this is it. 
it's really broad and deep in a lot of ways and and not not criticizing at all like we've simplified it to make it a little bit more sort of pertinent to the job and 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 fit into the boxes we want it to um but in doing some of the research i did it, it really is quite amazing how you can see even within yourself uh how this different sort of decision making and pieces fall into place um in certain things and the times we're living in right now is a perfect example like we you know, people who make decisions whether or not to wear a mask when they go outside, whether or not they're supposed to or not supposed to. Um, there are a lot of pieces of whether it's like peer group uh, pressure, whether it's a decision you're making on your own, or you're like, hey, I trust the scientists, whatever they tell me to do, I'm going to do it. Um, it. You can very easily sort of grab any of those thought processes and plug them into one part of this model and be like, oh, that's what it is. So um, if, if we don't, oh, Josh, we got something. No, I was just going to add, you know, I think for me, the other piece is that, um, and as I was learning this stuff, I, I realized that um, I, not to really take any one model and, and try to use it in isolation in my thinking. And, and as you're talking and, you know, as it jogs my memory, I was always struck by the similarity in how the, the complexity of thought uh, in moral development had to coincide with a lot of like Piaget's um, cognitive abilities and, and how those two had to kind of move in, in a sort of unison. Uh, you know, if you, you know, forgive me for, uh, for, you know, oh, really oversimplifying Piaget, but I think about the simplicity of thought of good is good and bad is bad, just how simple that sounds and how, you know, tangible that is. And as you move through the moral development, you can see that there's more and more and more nuance that goes on. So that the, to me, the two are, are, are very closely linked. Um, and rather than look at, um, for me, it was always more helpful instead of looking at one model in isolation, rather to look at how they were connected. And that gave me a better sense of how then I could use this stuff in, in coordination in a lesson or, sure. you know, prepping for my CS event. So I didn't have to think of a whole bunch of different things. I could look at how to package together into more of an authentic and realistic uh, presentation for, for a, a CS event or um, prep me for real life children. Yeah, and one, it makes perfect sense too. Um, if you bring uh, Abraham Maslow's model into the mix, if you're lower on that triangle, it is very difficult to be elevated in either cognitive thought or emotional maturity, right? <laughs> like if you really have to go to the bathroom, there's only one good thing that would be a toilet, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and, and how those, I, I love that you brought, brought that up because for me, you know, being tasked with talking about Kohlberg's, it was probably hard. Um, it, it, was, it was hard to kind of look at in isolation. I kept finding myself leaking towards Piaget and these other things. Um, so I love that you brought that up. Well, I have one more very funny video for us. Um, and I don't want anyone to think that I'm trying to make fun of moms. I didn't make this video, but uh, this one is another Jimmy Kimmel video. And it's, what is the worst thing you've ever heard mommy say? And I'll, I'll let Jimmy talk for the rest. 10, the Vegas buffet. Last night on the show, we talked about a new survey that claims that women are more prone to displays of road rage than men. Female drivers are more likely to give the finger and they're more likely to curse while their children are in the car. Now, I don't know if I believe that, but I don't, I don't think most mothers curse in front of their kids. But just in case, uh, I decided to conduct my own survey. I sent a camera crew out onto Hollywood Boulevard to ask young kids, what is the worst thing you ever heard mommy say? <laughs> kids are usually pretty honest about these things. So, well, let's find out what they had to share. What's the worst thing you've ever heard your mommy say when she's mad? Stupid. That's pretty bad. Who is she calling stupid? Me. What's the worst bad thing your mommy's ever said? Guys, we're trying to have a conversation here. Will you please be quiet? Does mommy ever yell? Yes. What does she say when she yells? No. 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 Grace, what's the worst thing your mommy's ever yelled when she's mad? Um. Stupid. 
That is intense. <laughs> she is disgusting. No, she just say mean words. She just say stupid. What is the worst thing you've heard your mommy say? Can I say it? Yes. <laughs> think of really those are the two absolute worst yeah. she's a monster <sighs> you probably get so mad that she uses a bad word in front of you yes <gasps> like what like the f word sometime and it probably all of them i heard out in the last eight years oh my I, god i probably heard all of them <laughs> one time what are they like the f word do you want me to say them do you want to say them <laughs> should i say them like and all that other shit. Like, <laughs> so, like, ow! Is it gonna be on TV? Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I've been meaning to ask, do you, do you need any help or support for that one tomorrow? Do you have everything squared away? Uh, it's funny. Uh, we set it up next uh, tomorrow. So the webinar I'll be hosting, uh, I actually, it's, it's more of a talk show format. So oh, okay. uh, I named it Beyond the Scorecard. And what it is, is a, an opportunity to uh, check in. We've got uh, John Wilchin. Uh, let me see if I can remember Jim Shaw, Jen Metz, and Tommy Banks are going to be joining nice. me and just talking about uh, their perspectives on skiing and teaching and getting to hear from them uh, beyond the scorecard. That's really cool. I, uh, I have it open on my schedule, so I'm planning on joining the watch as well. Cool. And yeah, and guys, if you're still on and you're jumping on there, the other thing too is if there are some other things that you're wanting to see covered and, you know, reach out, let DG know, let some of these other people we're going to be leading things know. Um, you know, we are, uh, we are, you know, this was actually a perfect example. This was a response. A few people asked similar questions about Kohlberg's uh, during one of the earlier kids ones. So this, this came from the membership and that, that uh, to me was what was so exciting about leading this. I'm like, great, people have questions. Let's, you know, let's drive that truck. Let's go. Yeah. Um, so very, very, very much appreciated. Cool. We still got a few more people on. I'm going to say thanks again. I'm seeing a lot of chats showing up, people thanking us. It's really, truly my pleasure to be able to do this for you guys today uh, with everyone's help. And awesome. Josh, you got to thanks so much. And oh, we got a, some of my favorites tomorrow. So somebody's yeah. definitely excited. <laughs> they don't have a name though. It just says iPhone. Oh, Kate was here. Yep. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. I'm going to shut my video off. Take care, everyone. We'll see you soon. Take care, everyone. Take care.